Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining our weekly podcast. I'm Robin Lewis, founder and CEO of The Robin Report, which, um, by the way, is much more, we call it a knowledge platform. Um, it really is a knowledge platform from which we um, communicate thought leadership on various strategic topics um, through the daily reports, yes, but also these podcasts uh, and webinars, as well as perhaps at some point in the future, we might go to live events. Um, anyway, along with our chief strategist, Shelly Cohan, who, by the way, is also a professor at FIT and Syracuse University, we welcome you to our conversation on the topic of when doing the right thing is forbidden. Retail CEOs are managing a business in a social and political minefield. And boy, what a topic, Shelley, because it really is true. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's kind of like the silent spring. Um, you wake up one morning and there are no birds chirping. <laughs> it's like the environmental disaster creeped up on us without having done anything about it. We're not fast enough. Again, we, we talk and talk about saving the planet, but is enough being done fast enough? And now across retail and all businesses for that matter, we are using a megaphone to convince businesses that the right thing to do, in fact, Gen Z is demanding it. And by the way, Shelly, as you pointed out in our previous podcast, by 2026, they will be the largest consumer group ever. So they will demand and force a lot of the right things to do. It's a diversity, uh, equality, and inclusion. It's accepting and respecting the rights of those with different beliefs, like the LBGTQ community. And we've also, <clears throat> And we've also, you know, been repeating over and over again that if brands and retailers want to appeal to this group and build loyalty among them, they must also become a part of the communities they are in, yep. their values, and even to partake in community events and supporting local causes, you know, and it goes on and on. So unlike the Silent Spring, Shelly and I decided to call out why doing the right thing is in danger. Ironically, it's being forbidden in many ways. So Shelly, do you wanna kick this off? Sure, Robin. Um, well, I'd like to start with the, what I think is the biggest poster child example that continues to play out even as we speak. So if there's one global brand that arguably, everyone would say does everything right, it's Disney, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, come on, Mickey Mouse? Like, who's <laughs> going to pick a fight with Mickey Mouse? <laughs> of course, we all know it's the governor of Florida. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, Robin, seriously, the feud started back when Disney criticized Governor DeSantis' parental rights and education bill, which is often referred to as the don't say gay bill. Um, well, Disney's, of course, standing up for the rights of its employees the visitors, and the community. And they've come out making statements against that bill. So then DeSantis yep. sways the Republican lawmakers to pass a bill that stripped Disney of its self-governing authority. And it's just spiraled from there. So I, I'm not sure why the governor would want to antagonize its second largest private sector employer in Florida. Right. And, and <laughs> by the way, as you know, Disney's a major contributor tourism in the state yep disney world brought in 60 million visitors to florida in 2019 and of course the pandemic hit and now they are about just under 40 million but the numbers i'm sure are going to get back up to that 60 million soon but it, it's interesting because republicans are typically known to be pro-business and here we have the lead yeah. republican DeSantis, and possibly presidential candidate taking a fight with a company that currently brings in over $1 billion in state and local tax revenues. Wow. 
So, you know, Disney's providing jobs and revenue to the state in a major way, yet the governor's picking a fight with them. It does, to me, it doesn't make sense. And it's it's not just this tit for tat back and forth, but in, in addition to, you know, taking away Disney's governing status, DeSante's threatened to put a prison there, right next to Disneyland, low income yep. housing, you know, so really just, you know, needling Disney. Um, you know, most states are really trying to get big companies to move to their states, set up shop in their towns, and even go through uh, this huge bidding process um, so they can reap the benefits of having these big companies land in their states. So Disney stands up for LGBT rights for workers, customers, and the community, and now the governor's threatening to pull away the company's status, rights. Oh, boy. Yeah, Shelly, you know, it is worth noting that one of the first very public spats regarding companies speaking out against anti-LGBTQ <laughs> that acronym's difficult for me to say. <laughs> anyway, the, the state law was back in March of 2015 when Mike Pence was a governor of Indiana. The, wall, the law called uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act was passed at the end of March in 2015, which allows uh, businesses to use an owner's faith as a reason to refuse service to customers, including same-sex married couples. Businesses push back on the law, and in that case, Pence and the state legislature backed down and revised the law in less than a week of it being passed. So uh, they backed down because a lot of companies stood up and pushed back. I mean, companies uh, were fearful that getting talented workers to move to the state, they're forcing existing ones to move out, out of the state based on the new law would hinder companies in Indiana. Um, Salesforce.com CEO Mark Benioff uh, said in a tweet that the company would be forced to dramatically reduce its spending in the state. He also called on the rest of the tech industry to take a stand against the Indiana government's uh, decision. Yelp a CEO, Jeremy Stubbelman, uh, said in its official blog that it would be unconscionable mm -hmm. to imagine that Yelp would create, maintain, or expand a significant business present, presence in any state that encourage discrimination by businesses against our employees, our, cons our consumers uh, at large. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, Shelly, there were more examples, but those were just a few. You know, as I've often said, I'm glad that I only need to observe <laughs> the retail industry as opposed to actually operating in it. It gets tough, tough, and more tough. And now, these retail leaders have to check their backs, watching out for a political move uh, like Disney. Yeah, I mean, well, in Florida, of course, DeSantis, not only did he not back down from passing some of these laws, but he also penalized the companies that spoke out. So um, so here, it, here, how's it going for DeSantis? Well, in April of this year, Disney sued DeSantis with orchestrating a campaign of government retaliation against the company and violating its protected speech. Yep. So, and, and Disney's not the only example in terms of governments interfering with businesses. I have to mention one other example, happens to also be in the state of Florida, but the Stop Woke Act, which was signed mm. in uh, 2022, which prohibits instruction on race relations or diversity that implies a person's status, either privileged or oppressed, is necessarily determined by his or her race or color, national origin or sex. So in layman terms, the government is telling companies and state schools that they can't teach diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, a topic that you and I have talked about a lot and a topic that retail companies are really focused on. Yep. But in Florida, they're not allowed to have these programs. So, for example, Lululemon is an example of a company that has a DEI training program for their employees, which helps to really provide greater equity and inclusion within its own workers. 
but also by employees going to training and creating this awareness about behaviors that promote more inclusive work environments, it then elevates the customer experience in the stores as well, because the customers yep. are feeling more um, inclusive as well. So people in general want to be and want to feel included. But in Florida, Lululemon had to pull back all of its DEI training, like many other companies had to do. Mm -hmm. So if companies aren't able to use these initiatives to further inclusion and equity in the workplace, it impacts customers, it impacts employees, and it impacts the community. So I, I don't know, governments shouldn't be telling companies what they can and cannot train their employees. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this idea, by the way, goes beyond Disney and Florida. Uh, look, look, look at what's happened uh, with Bud Light. Uh, Kid Rock and Travis uh, Tritt were two celebrities demanding a boycott on Bud Light because the company chose a transgender influencer an activist, Dylan Mulvaney, as a spokesperson for the brand. Um, you know, the partnership with Bud Light consisted of the social media personality uh, sharing with her nearly 2 million followers that the beer company was celebrating her first anniversary of transitioning genders by creating a beer can with her face on it. <laughs> It was apparently part of Bud Light's more extensive pride campaign, uh, you know, celebrating everyone's identity. Uh, Bud Light sales for the third week in April were down 21.4% as a result of the boycott compared to the same time last year. Uh, the week before, sales were down 17%. So Buzz, uh, Bud Light has made some moves following the backlash and uh, one of which is the VP of marketing taking leave of absence. That was um, Alyssa Heinerscheid. Um, so, you know, conservative personalities accuse the brewer of catering to woke culture. And many are boycotting the beer and its product company, and that's okay too. That is also part of capitalism. So, you know, I mean, the retailers, whether they be, uh, uh, you know, Bud Light or Disney or whoever, you know, they they have to give the consumer what the consumer wants. And if 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 you know, Bud Light threw out this idea, um, but now they're probably going to pull back on it because their consumer uh, doesn't want that. <laughs> right, and I think there. The idea of standing up for these cultural shifts in society goes beyond government laws and politics. Yeah. You know, companies are, are, are doing this to reach their target markets and they're doing it to change with the times. So yeah. since, since we moved to beer, <laughs> let me just tell you about Miller Lite's new video advertisement. It's titled, and excuse the cursing here, but bad shit to good shit. <laughs> and what it is, it features Ilana Glazer announcing initiative from the beer company that it's going to try to make up for not always doing right by women. So uh, that whole initiative is saying they're taking all these old sexist beer advertisements and transforming it into fertilizer to be uh, used by women brewers to grow hops. So the company also announced that purchases of Miller Lite beer products supported a $60,000 donation to the Pink Boot Society, which aims to assist and inspire and encourage women and non-binary individuals in the fermented alcohol beverage industry to advance their careers through education. So, you know, it's a company looking at past behaviors, recognizing that maybe it should have been doing things differently based on shifts in cultural beliefs and norms. Yep. You remember, Robin, Gillette tried to do this in there, we believe the man can be uh, the man, the best the man can be campaign back in 2019, which really garnered a lot of criticism by actually customers at the time who viewed the ads as a vilification of masculinity. And it cost the company eight billion dollars from wow. the backlash from the, you know, backlash from the consumers. But let me tell you, Gillette CEO. Gary Comey said that the purpose of the ad was to increase their market share around millennial audiences. Mm -hmm. 
And then when asked about the revenue and the loss of revenue as a fallout from that ad, Combi said, we believe it, it was a price worth paying. He thinks the company now today is in a better place. It has 50% women on its board and mm. they picked up a significant larger female consumer. So, you know, and just to give you some numbers, because we love numbers, in 2019, when the ad came out, Procter & Gamble grooming division dropped 5% in revenue. But you fast forward to 2022, and the grooming division is up 6% compared to 2019. So they've more than made up that drop. Mm -hmm. You know, advertising reflects the views of society. So companies are trying to do what's right for their markets. You know, Gillette also has now a gender affirming ads as well. So. Yeah, and you know, just recently, Shelly, a few, uh, actually a few days ago, Levi Strauss, uh, CEO Chip Berg, was asked, asked by Axios reporter Hope King about marketing products to a market <clears throat> made of consumers who are more aware of their gender identities. Berg said his company's collection of gender neutral or gender fluid clothing options is something he supports and sees growing despite the fierce pushback that Anheuser-Busch had received for its partnership with the transgender activists. Um, and there you go. There is a CEO, Chipper, who is not afraid to take a chance. Um, a you know, companies have to do what is right for their target market and the communities that they operate in. So. CEOs have a difficult job finding the right balance, doing the right things and supporting the right causes for, you know, for their company. Yeah. And to be honest, Robin, letting the government run business is probably not a great idea. So if you look at the USPS and Amtrak as two companies being run by the government, neither one is making a profit. I mean, technically in 2020, yeah. USPS, the post office, did make a profit, but that was because of a favorable $57 billion one-time benefit following the enactment of the Postal Service Reform Act. But typically, both both these massive companies lose money every year. So not to get sidetracked here, but... No, but that, yeah, but, but, but that is so true. You're right. Um, and by the way, I, <laughs> our economy would collapse if we left the operation of business up to the government. <laughs> I, I, Ronald Reagan had some statement he made um something about the biggest fear businesses should have is to hear the words where the government's uh, something we're the government and we're we're here to help you <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, that, that, that's a real big paraphrase so uh, yeah anyway and that is why it's silly for politicians to stick their noses into companies like Disney. I mentioned um, Levi and Chip Berg, you know, and there, but there are many other brands in retail, Shelley, as you know, who are smartly adapting their businesses to align with consumers' values and, and what they are demanding. I mean, they are not stupid. Yeah. They are not servicing the consumer's demands. The consumer just leaves their store, walks across the street to another store that is. I don't think most people understand that. In our own restored economy, <clears throat> if one retailer is not doing what the, that consumer wants, they'll go to another consumer, probably within walking distance. Anyway, there should be a balance, if you will, and, and an ecosystem whereby communities and companies can work together to drive profits and serve all stakeholders, which includes the communities and not just stockholders. Right. Well, according to Tim Moen, he's the uh, he's a partner and director over at Boston Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. and he's also a global sustainability thought leader. Um, he mentioned in, in a recent blog post that there's been 44 bills and new laws introduced in 2022 from 17 Republican-led states aimed at companies issuing policies on climate change, gun control, diversity, and other social issues. 
And this is a marked increase in the push to punish woke companies in conservative states where only a dozen of such measures were proposed back in 2021. Oh boy. Yeah, you know, last year, um, a pivot point in this woke capitalism was when major companies stepped up giving employees travel uh, cost re reimbursements for abortions, you know, after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, some states uh, push back on companies by creating new legislation designed to punish companies for supporting these causes. You know, a Republican Texas lawmaker, uh, Briscoe Kane, said he plans legislation to outlaw such coverage and prohibit companies that provide it from receiving any Texas state business or contracts. Kane was quoted in uh, Reuters uh, last year as stating, no corporation doing business in Texas will be allowed to subsidize abortions or abortion travel in any manner. Boy. You know, Walgreens is an interesting case of a retailer who's kind of being squeezed politically from the left and the right. So, you know, the company after the Roe versus Wade was overturned said it was not going to distribute the abortion pill in the 21 states that threatened to sue pharm pharmacies that did sell the pill. So as a result of Walgreens caving towards Republican attorney generals in those states by not distributing the drug, it received backlash from governor in California, Gavin Newsom, when the governor said he'd stop doing business with Walgreens. So the Democratic governor Newsom pulled a $54 million contract away from Walgreens that would have gone into effect May 1st. Oh boy, yeah, excuse me, Georgia, in, in 2021, passed a voting restriction laws, uh, and, and two of the biggest companies in Georgia, Delta and Coca-Cola, were criticized for not doing enough to stand up against uh, these new laws. At first, Delta came out with soft language <laughs> about how the laws were better than the previous versions uh, that were suggested by uh, but when people started these boycotts, Delta did a 180 degree turn and criticized the new voting laws. Guess what? The state passed bills stripping Delta of multi million dollar tax breaks after it slammed the state's new voting restrictions. Well, Rom, you remember even the Major League Baseball got involved yeah. in that one because they moved the 2021 All-Star Game out of Atlanta in response to the new Georgia voting laws yep. over to Coors Field in Denver of that year. Yeah, it's incredible. All of the um, interference by the government is just another piece of a scary ongoing, bigger potential, Shelley, for the, for the U.S. to lose its democracy. You know, a healthy capitalism cannot survive without the... Uh, general freedom of a democracy. Well, bureaucracy should not run companies. Retailers and brands should run companies on how they see fit aligns with the target market. Yep. If a company supports the LBGTQ community um, or transgender or non-binary or wants to create more inc inclusive work environments, bureaucracy shouldn't be created to make it more difficult for companies to operate. Right. If, if, if the U.S., in the U.S. market, you know, if the businesses stop making money, guess who loses? The government. I mean, it's if, yeah. brands, if brands and retailers want to appeal to the next largest consumer buying power, they have to build loyalty among them. Retailers have to become, as you said earlier, when we opened up, part of the community they live in. Their values, what they stand up for, yeah. they have to, you know, be involved in local causes. And I think the smart brands get this. The more does yep. the world is more inclusive and the pressures to do the right thing have never ever been stronger than they are today. Yeah, well, the Disney outcome uh, will tell us a lot. You know, whether we're headed down a deeper rabbit hole or um, 
if businesses can return to what they do best, giving the consumer what they want. And today, because our younger generation and its new set of values, what they want also includes that the retailer buy into those same values, you know, by including DEI, diversity, quality, inclusion, sustainability, you know, and a respect for human rights. And as we leave this podcast, Shelley, I want to emphasize to our listeners, and this is really important, that this is not, this is not a political issue, okay? Um, you know, it really is a consumer issue and what they demand of their brands and retailers. This is capitalism. It is not to be, you know, uh, tampered with by the government. It is giving <laughs> any retailer in this country and probably in the world will say, you know, what is what is, what is what is your mission in life? You're going to say to give the consumer what they want. You know, of course that's paraphrasing, but that's what this podcast was all about. Yeah, Robin, it is. It is a consumer issue. And the back and forth between government and business right now kind of reminds me of the tit for tat pricing among competitors. And yep. you've always said this, it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. The only one that wins on tit for tat pricing is the consumer with lower prices until Robin, there is no competition and prices go back up. And it's this tit for tat with government on business, no one wins, not even the consumer. Yep. So for our listeners, you can find more of our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Buzzsprout, and therobinreport.com. And please look for us on YouTube where we broadcast our podcast as well. And follow us on social media, link in with us for the latest thoughts about the industry. And I want to give a final big thanks to all of you for joining us. And um, as I mentioned every week, if you have a topic that you would like Shelly and I to cover, just shoot an email over to me, robin at therobinreport.com. And um, thanks again.